Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome back to the Mixed Reality Speaker Series. Uh, so today we have a really cool presentation for you. Uh, this is about MRTK v3. Uh, this is something that I've been looking forward to hearing a lot more about, uh, just because this is kind of one of the, the founding blocks of our uh, MRTK or Mixed Reality Development Experience. Uh, so today with us, we have a, a number of people from the Mixed Reality Toolkit team. Uh, so I'm really happy to have them on. We're going to, to have them give a presentation. It'll be be maybe around half an hour and then after that they'll be around for uh, some additional questions. So Kevin Semple will be speaking and then we also have uh, David and Curtis around to answer some of the, the deeper technical questions. So uh, I'm going to hand it over to them to, to do some introductions first so you can say hello to them. Uh, so first uh, we'll go over to you David. Say hello. Hi I'm Dave. Uh, good to see you all. And uh, for Curtis. Hey, yeah, welcome. Looking forward to, to presenting this to you guys, or for Kevin too. <laughs> Should be good. All right, and Kevin, you can go ahead and take it away now. So thank you so much. Thank you. I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Welcome everyone. My name is Kevin Semple and I am the program manager for the Mixed Reality Toolkit. I like to spend my time looking out into the community, talking to customers, trying to understand how people are using the Mixed Reality Toolkit, and then planning for the team to make sure that we are providing the best developer experience possible. Now today we're going to talk about V3 and we're going to talk about how we're looking to improve the developer experience for all. Today, we'll take a look back at V2. We'll answer the question, why build a V3 in the first place? We'll cover what's new and talk about some feature prototypes. We'll look at what's next, and then we'll stop to answer all of your questions. So to get things started, what is the Mixed Reality Toolkit for Unity? It's a Microsoft-driven open source project that provides components, features, spatial building blocks to accelerate mixed reality app development in Unity. Now, from the beginning, it has sought to be a cross-platform uh, developer platform. And we wanna make sure that we're enabling people to do rapid prototyping. We wanna make sure that it's extensible. And these are things that we've stuck to since the beginning, you know, especially when it comes to supporting a wide range of devices. As we look towards MRTK v3, these are all things that we will remain to hold true to us. How did that play out in MRTK v2? We had a lot of really cool features baked in. You know, MRTK v2 saw the introduction of graduated features such as object manipulation, solvers, and the scrolling object collection. We added support for OpenXR, you know, that makes it easy to add new devices, even if we don't, as the Mixed Reality Toolkit, explicitly support them. Speaking of which, we saw the community add support for the Oculus Quest, and then we saw vendors like uh, those who work on Magic Leap or the Leap Motion Controller add support for their devices to the Mixed Reality Toolkit too. So when it comes to being hashtag open, we've held true to that for sure. Now, we also introduced something called uh, the Mixed Reality Feature Tool to improve discoverability and acquisition of packages. We added features like dialog boxes, gesture controls for teleportion, and lots, lots more. A lot of words to say that MRTK v2 was very, very feature rich. There were also lots of tools and utilities. Some of the improvements around profiles, making it possible to support both legacy XR and XR SDK in the same profile. We had a simplified project set up with uh, the MRTK project configurator, something that has seen a lot of iterations over time to make it super, super easy for people who are new to the toolkit to get their project up and running. We heard from you that it was difficult to understand what are all the UI features that I can use in my project. So we created a toolbox so that you can scroll through and see what you can drag and drop into your project. 
And then we heard when it comes to buttons, sometimes it can be tricky to customize them. So we added the button configurator so that you can quickly switch out icons and labels for the buttons to make them your own. And then another one, when it comes to testing, we made public the test utilities package that we, the MRTK team, use internally to test so that you can use it as well. So lots of improvements from uh, innovating on features, introducing new features, adding utilities, as we focused on improving that developer experience. But that's not all. MRTK v2 saw the consolidation of our documentation. For those who have been riding with us from the Hollow Toolkit days, or even slightly after that, you would have seen a lot of our documentation on GitHub. Now, we learned that it can be tricky navigating from GitHub to docs and Microsoft.com and trying to you know, get a handle of where all of the documentation lives. So we decided to consolidate all of our docs onto docs.microsoft.com. This allows you to have a one-stop shop for all of the docs that you need for MR, MRTK, and whatever it is that you want to develop. We've also been working on our tutorials and we saw the MRTK V2 tutorials grow. They almost doubled in fact, and we've even got them hosted on Microsoft Learn. If you've never heard of MS Learn, it is a platform that is geared towards learning. It's a learning management system that allows you to go through modules and it captures wherever you stop so that if you revisit it, you can pick up right where you left off. You can leave us feedback. You can rate the tutorials so we know where we need to work on. And it makes it easy to just see what is everything that is available to me in a nice gamified learning fashion. So if you're looking to help your colleagues learn or you want to even teach the Mixed Reality Toolkit, this is a great place to go. And then we're talking about the Mixed Reality Feature Tool. You know, an easy way to discover and learn about which features are available for not just the Mixed Reality Toolkit, but all of the packages across MR, or at least that's our goal. And from the looks of it, we've got a ton of packages available today. So MRTK v2, it had a lot going on. So why even build a v3? This is the question that a lot of people have been asking, and I'm really happy to be able to answer it for you today. We're going to start by taking a look at the feedback that we've been hearing from you, the community, feedback from some of our enterprise developers, and feedback that we've been seeing online in a variety of mediums. One piece of feedback I've heard since I joined the MRTK team is that the MRTK comes off as monolithic. People say, I want just one subsystem. Why do I have to bring all of MRTK into my project when I just want one piece of it? We've heard people say, hey, I have my own input system. Do I have to use yours? I've heard people say, you know, when I load up my projects, you know, sometimes I see that it uh, slows down in the editor because there's just so much going on. Now, while we have made some improvements going from one MRTK package that is uh, a really, really large, plus a, a utilities package to now having eight packages available, we still see room for improvement so that we can, we can enable people who just want one subsystem or who want independent pieces to be able to move forward. We've heard that design integrity is hard and that MR layout is laborious. What does that mean? It means that not everyone has a full-on design team to help them build their apps. And we know that in the 2D world, there are lots of design tools that make it easy for people who aren't even designers to build apps and websites. You know, I think of when I was learning web development, you know, I could use something like Bootstrap to quickly build a, a 2D website and make it look nice and polished and organized because of the layout tools that existed. When we look at the MR space, those types of tools don't exist. And what we end up seeing is that if there are lots of panels in an app, they tend to not quite be aligned. And it's one of those things that just makes an app, although engaging, not look as polished as it could be. 
So we aspire to address this feedback with layout tools to make it easy for designers and even non-designers to quickly build apps that look great. We've heard people say, I can't afford the performance hit, meaning that sometimes there are scenarios where frame rates drop and they want to make sure that they're providing their end users with the best experience possible. We've also heard people say that the learning curve is too steep. There's a high barrier to entry, they say, and once they get over it, then they see the value of MRTK, but they would prefer if it was not so high of a barrier. Now, although we've improved our tutorials and increased the number of them, we still know that there are opportunities to reduce that barrier to entry so that it's easy to bring on new members onto your dev team to work with the toolkit. Speaking of working with the toolkit, we've heard that uh, MRTK can be difficult to customize. We know that some of our game objects have really deep hierarchies that make it tricky to uh, make them look and feel the way that you want them to. So this has been a piece of feedback that is uh, really resonating with us. Now, many development teams are trying to stay up to date with what's going on in the industry, whether it means adopting new technology or creating it themselves. And so we know that many teams have a high velocity, and that tends to mean that there's a cost to updating. What would it look like if it wasn't so costly to update so that more people could get the new value that we add into the latest updates with MRTK? Now, here's one that I hear quite frequently, especially for people who are building apps that are gonna have large scale deployments. I want to use dynamic data in my UX. And what we've seen is that there are many people who are building their own versions of this, their own ways to handle dynamic data. And what ends up happening very often is that when we update MRTK, something breaks in their solution, which means they can't update, they have to stay on an older version. So what can we as a team do to enable everyone to leverage this really awesome feature that is already existent in 2D platforms and very common, in fact. We've heard that testing is difficult, and we know this firsthand since we do a, quite a bit of testing when we put out a major release. So we want to make it easier for others to test as well. We know that Unity dropped support for Unity 2018 and Legacy XR, which means that it's time to move one step up at least in what we support for the toolkit. And then we know that accessibility is required for mass adoption. And as we seek to bring more and more people into the fold so that they can enjoy mixed reality, making sure that we have those features that make it super inclusive are going to be important to making sure that mixed reality truly is for all. Now you may be thinking, hey, I have some feedback that is not captured here. Or you might be thinking, hey, that line about just having one subsystem really, really resonates with me. Whatever you're feeling or thinking in this moment, we want to know from you, you know, are these the things that we should be focusing on? So if you have feedback for us or you have a question, please, please, please drop it into the chat. At the end, you'll get uh, a link to a survey where you can tell us about the features that you hope to see. We want to make sure that we're including your voice as we go through our development cycle. Now, enough about what we've heard, let's talk about what is new. There are a lot of new things coming in MRTK v3. And for those of you who don't know, we've actually already started development. As an MRTK team, we've decided that we would take on the heavy lift of initially porting some of those core MRTK v2 features to v3 before we open it up to the public so that you don't have to do that heavy lifting with us. We do it for you and then you can join in. Now I'm going to break down what's new into these categories. I'll start with architecture, I'll cover performance, I'll talk about UI improvements, and then I'll talk about UX and interactions. When it comes to our architecture with MRTK v3, the key thing that 
really, really separates this from V2 is that independent subsystems will be easily will be able to be easily integrated with non MRTK code. I'm going to say that again, independent subsystems that can easily be integrated with non MRTK code. That's a big departure from MRTK V2 that we believe will set up a lot of people for success. What does that mean? That means that you can take an independent component and integrate it with MRTK V2. It means you could take an independent component and integrate it with something that's not even MRTK related. It's really opening up your options and how you choose to implement and adopt the toolkit. With our new architecture, we're taking a new focus on making sure that our components are robust and, and ready for enterprise scale. We want to make it super easy for you to build an app and then have a mass deployment. We want to keep up with the pace of industry innovation, which means updating our minimum requirements. And as with MR2K v2, we are holding true to our dedication to being a cross-platform developer platform. So that means supporting HoloLens 2, mixed reality, uh, Windows mixed reality devices, Android, iOS, Oculus Quest, Leap Motion, controllers, and much, much more. So when it comes to those new minimum requirements, if you haven't heard already, Unity has put out a, a, a something that they're calling the Unity XR Interaction Toolkit, or XRI for short. This is their new way of handling interactions and input, and we are basing MRTK v3 on this. Now, we believe this is the right path to go because it really allows us, the MRTK team, to focus on those things that really make MR unique and add value to what Unity does really well. Now, this will enable us to accelerate our development in the MR space while allowing Unity to focus on that underlying plumbing that will make you know, MR apps functional. So if you've already adopted XRI, that's great. We're going to be building on top of it and bringing lots of additional value to you. A new minimum requirement for V3 will be OpenXR. Now, you have an opportunity to use OpenXR in MRTK V2. But as we look to focus our development effort and take new bets on the future of mixed reality, Microsoft is all in on OpenXR, which is why we're making it a core piece of MRTK V3. What does this mean for you? This means that if there is a device that is brand new on the market that we haven't explicitly supported or announced for MRTK, you can, with very little, uh, very little effort, add support for that device. And we see that already with MRTK v2. If you've been in the Hollow Developer Slack, I see messages from people saying, hey, I was able to add this new device to my supported list for MRTK v2 thanks to OpenXR. And that's the whole idea, making sure that it is open. And then finally, Unity 2020.3 LTS. That is where we'll be placing our stake in the ground for MRTK v3. Now, that's a lot, a lot of new things. How does this architecture fit together? Now, here's a nice diagram to really explain what is going on in MRTK v3. The blue boxes represent MRTK features that have zero dependencies on the rest of MRTK. The yellow boxes are parts of MRTK that depend on other blocks of MRTK or parts of Unity. And then the purple blocks are Unity only, with the white at the bottom being OpenXR and Microsoft extensions. So from a high level, MRTK has a new theming and branding feature. There is a new volumetric layout feature. There's a data binding feature. And we aspire to also add accessibility and port over our tools from V2. And these features will be completely independent of the rest of MRTK. That means if you wanted to just use our theming feature in your app that doesn't use any other MRTK, hey, go for it. We want to enable you to do that. If you want to use volumetric layout and theming, go for it. Do that too. We're looking at enabling people to choose how they adopt MRTK when it comes to V3. Now, these separations are going to be uh, the inspiration for our new packaging. And as we go through our previews of V3, we certainly want to hear from you. You know, is this the right separation 
for the scenarios that you want to enable in your apps. So if you have feedback or questions, please drop it into the chat so we can answer them for you. Now, I want to call out that uh, you know MRTK is sitting on top of Unity's XRI, its input system, and its XRAR subsystems. We are adding that additional value through our own MRTK subsystems that will be additive, meaning you choose which ones you want to put into your project and activate. Again, all of this to say, making it easy for you, the developers, to choose how you integrate and adopt MRTK v3. So that's the architecture. Let's switch over and talk about the new UI that's coming. If you've used the Microsoft Mesh app, you've seen the new mixed reality design language. This is a bit of a departure from the classic HoloLens 2 style blue. It is a new kind of a purplish bluish color that I think looks great on device. Now, we've also changed the curvature of the, of the uh, panels, as you can see here with this slate example. But to take it a step further, we've heard a lot of people say, when I want to add my own theming and branding to my mixed reality app, I have to go in and update every asset one by one. And that takes a very long time. So we created a new theming system that goes all the way down to dynamically generated collections so that you can quickly apply new themes to the assets in your app. And this is something you can do at edit time or something you can even do at runtime. We can see in the GIF at the bottom there, someone switching between themes at the pinch of a button. We also had one of our MRTK team members build an app that can actually switch themes from the cloud. So if you want to have your, your app you know, look different based on who's using it, maybe you're building an app for a set of clients, maybe you're building it for a particular organization and you want it to have their branding, that's something that you could build into the app, have them authenticate when they log in, and boom, switch the look and feel to match what it should be for that particular individual. So we're really excited to bring this feature to MRTK along with its updated UI. Now, this new theming feature is powered by dynamic UI through a new data binding feature. In this particular example, this developer is loading in pictures from the website Flickr in real time and then populating their MRTK assets with them. Now, this data binding solution is also leveraging list virtualization and data pooling to make it performant. So although there are a thousand pictures living on the back end, only a subset of those are actually loaded in and displayed. And there are guards in there to make sure that as you scroll through the list, we're not re-instantiating objects that already exist. So this is a solution that uh, we're proving out and with internal teams and making sure that it is robust enough for the enterprise solutions that we know some of you are focused on. I spoke about volumetric layout tools, so here is them in action. We're already used to seeing responsive layouts on our phones and on our tablets when we use the web, and now we're bringing this concept to mixed reality. We can see here in the top left, you know, a parent container that is changing the orientation of its child objects as the parent container scales. We can see in the top right being able to quickly stack objects along the X, Y, or Z axis, something that you know is very common in PowerPoint. And then you can keep the padding between the uh, the objects as you scale that parent container as well. We can see in the bottom right having a parent container with non-uniform objects that automatically rearrange themselves based on the size of the parent container. So a lot of these concepts that we're used to seeing on our 2D experiences are now being brought to 3D and giving you, the developer, the option to choose which axes these concepts will actually play out through. And as you look at these GIFs, you can see we've also given careful attention to how you implement these. 
with the buttons that show up in the editor in the inspector making it super clear what's happening and giving you the flexibility and power to customize your apps the way you want what does this mean for you well we're making it easier to quickly build apps that are nice and polished so that you can have a really nice look to your your uh, production apps now the cool thing about layout is that it has some additional implications, especially around curved layouts. If you think about how you typically swipe something when you're scrolling through a list, you know, your arm makes a natural curved motion. So we were exploring what it, what it means to actually bring this to mixed reality. And you can see here, you have full customization abilities on the actual curvature of this layout. And although you're curving the layout, the actual game objects are themselves not being curved. However, it gives you the illusion that they are. This adds a lot of flexibility and opens up some new avenues for how you might choose to convey information in mixed reality. So I'm excited to see how you will use this, this feature in the future. Switching gears now. Interactions, what's new? Well, when it comes to input and interactions, they're all being handled through Unity's XRI which means that there will be breaking changes from V2. In fact, if you look to port your app from V2 to V3, your interactions will need a rewrite. We believe that even with this, the value of V3 will make it worth it. And so we are excited to see how you choose to use these new interactions through the XRI. When we put out the HoloLens 2 and MRTK V2, we have this goal of making sure that whatever you see in the HoloLens shell, you can also recreate in MRTK. And this will continue to be true for the Mixed Reality Toolkit. And we're gonna take it one step further and say that the experiences you see in first party apps, things that go into the App Store should also be able to be created with MRTK V3 as well. So if you've already used the Microsoft Mesh app, you'll be familiar with the new mixed reality design language and some of the new interactions that are in experimental mode in that app, which you can go try out today. Things like uh, gaze and, and, and pinch. We are bringing those to MRTK V3 as well so that anything that you see, you can also recreate for yourselves. And then one other thing I'd like to call out, you know, we know that testing has been tricky for folks. We're making steps to make testing we're taking steps to make testing easier and when it comes to input simulation i'm really happy to announce that from xrsdk's point of view and mrtk v3 hands in input simulation are the same as real hands as far as xrsdk is concerned this means it should be easier to pick up bugs faster and more often when it comes to hand interaction that we know is core to creating a lot of immersive experiences and, and mixed reality experiences as well. So really excited about the improvements to input simulation. Seeing these things in action, I've got a quick video here that is going to demonstrate these uh, new mixed reality design language pressable buttons being activated by voice, by uh, far interaction, and by being pressed. So as you can see, already making lots of progress when it comes to implementing MRTK V3 and running it on device. So that begs the question, what's next? You're probably asking yourself, when can I get my hands on MRTK V3? When can I start contributing to the toolkit? MRTK V3 is currently in development internally. What we're focusing on right now is porting our core UX building blocks. We're focused on internal validation with the internal teams here at Microsoft, and then making sure that we do a thorough performance analysis so that we can be clear on the performance gains between MRTK V2 and V3. Today, what we're seeing with performance is when running on a HoloLens 2, 
a significant amount of frames have uh, six to eight milliseconds of GPU wait time. We also see that our hand interaction example scene is running at 60 frames per second. And this is before we've even done a formal performance uh, analysis and, and pure focus on optimization. So we're excited about the opportunities we have here to make it even more performant than it already is under this new architecture. Now you can expect in spring of 2022 to get access to MRTK v3 through our public preview. And as part of this, you'll get access to the whole new architecture based on XRI that is running on OpenXR, the new mixed reality design language, independent subsystems that you can bring in through the, uh, the packages that will be available, the new UI theming system, data binding, the collection navigator, which is our evolution of the scrolling object collection, making it easier to get smooth scrolling lists that are all data bound, volumetric layout tools, input simulation improvements, and our core UX building blocks. The purpose of our public preview is of course to get your feedback. We want to make sure that we're heading in the right direction and that if we need to course correct, we can do so early. And when that public preview goes out, that's when our repo will be made public and you'll be able to start contributing to the Mixed Reality Toolkit v3. But what does this mean for MRQK v2? We know that there are some folks who, for whatever reason, might need to stay on MRTK v2 even after v3 comes out. And we want to make sure that we're enabling those folks to do just that. Now remember, MRTK v3 has independent subsystems that can easily be integrated with non-MRTK code. That means components like layout, like theming, data binding, and more can live alongside MRTK v2, no problem. You can choose how you want to adopt and, and upgrade and even coexist, have, the, have these toolkits coexist. But when it comes to the actual long-term story for MRTK v2, although we haven't announced our official GA date, our plan right now is that MRTK v2 will transition to community maintenance mode six months after MRTK v3's official release. That means you'll be able to still raise PRs against v2, the MRTK team will still be approving PRs, and we will determine what cadence is most appropriate based on you know, the amount of uh, involvement we have from the community and the fixes that are necessary to make sure that folks can continue to use MRTK v2 as they so desire. With that, we're going to switch over to some Q&A. And so if you haven't already, please drop a question into the chat and give us an opportunity to engage with you. We'll also be dropping a link to a survey where you can add in which features you would like to see as part of MRTK v3 and tell us about you know how excited you are for the new features that are coming up. So let's switch over to our Q&A. I'm going to bring back uh, Curtis and Dave to help us answer some questions here. All right, let me open up the Q&A portion of Teams here. All right, I see a question. MRTK team is great, and it's good to know about V3, especially OpenXR. I remembered V3 decision was made a few months back. Curious to know when the decision already made in favor for OpenXR and V3, then why MRTK is keep investing time in 2.x version. Just curious. Great question, Sadiq. Uh, if you go to our MRTK V2 GitHub repo, you'll actually see an issue pinned that uh, had our question of, uh, you know, hey, how would you feel about us taking a new dependency on OpenXR? And so this decision happened quite some time back and uh, we had some overall positive feedback around moving to OpenXR. And so, you know, I, I don't know the exact time frame, but it was made quite a while ago. Now on the question of why continue investing time in MRTK 2.x, 
we have uh, several customers today who are still using MRTK V2. And we want to make sure that those individuals who are very close to releasing or have recently released an app can continue to get the support that they need for their large scale deployments. So that is the reason we're choosing to uh, maintain MRTK V2. But as you saw in the presentation there, you know the, the idea here is that putting it into maintenance mode will allow folks to still get bug fixes while we, our team, focus on V3. All right, I see uh, Khaled from Island Lab saying, wow, that's huge. Glad I explored XRI the last half year. Yes, super happy to hear that. And uh, happy for the uh, XRI integration in V3. I see a question from Derek. Are we considering Unity's transition to data-oriented technology stack in the future? Uh, Curtis, Dave, do you want to take this one? Sure. Um... Okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, um, yes. So you know, we're we're sort of constantly talking with with Unity and, and paying attention to what's what's coming down the road. Um, you know, right now we've we've chosen to sort of focus on sort of uh, you know Unity's uh, the, the XR interaction toolkit, Unity's new uh, input system, um, both of which are not you know 100 percent sort of dots dots focused and that sort of thing um but as as those packages or you know future unity packages start to transition that's and certainly you know been in the back of our mind for you know since since unity announced you know ecs and dots you know a couple of years ago now um I, I certainly see you know as as unity starts transition transitioning to sort of more of a, a dots first sort of ecs first world um i i certainly see us you know uh joining them on that on that sort of journey but so you know as, as we sort of started in mrtk2 with some of those you know profiles and data providers um and we were sort of going a step further in v3 and adopting unity's um sort of subsystems pattern for for sort of our uh sort of you know essentially you know what v2 data providers were um we're, we're trying to have you know a bit of a focus on that sort of separation of data and, and where the data is stored and where the data is coming from from the actual you know logic of of the toolkit um but so it's it's not sort of an 100 percent you know dots ecs focused world but we're trying to make some decisions now that will hopefully enable that you know future in the future um but yeah so you know nothing nothing sort of solid not, not, nothing to announce but um it's it's certainly in the back of our mind uh, for sure. Thanks for the question, Derek. I see a question from Roni Portelli. What will be the dependencies to use the core UX components? Dave, I think that's a great question for you. Awesome. Uh, so at this time, the the dependencies are the XR interaction toolkit. And then the MRTK interaction layers, so our pointers, our gaze support, and our stateful interactions, those are going to work together uh, very closely to help give you feature parity with V2 while adding some additional flexibility. Additional dependencies haven't quite yet been identified, and if they are, we'll make a point of letting folks know. Uh, Curtis, did you want to add anything? Um, nope, that, that, that. <laughs> Great. I see a question from Sean Ong. Hey, Sean, great to see you here. Great news on V3. What can developers do in the meantime to prepare for V3? Familiarize with XRI, OpenXR, et cetera, question mark. Uh, Curtis, Dave? All of those. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, basically, uh, XRI is our future, so it's a good plan to be familiar with it and get used to, or maybe spend some time learning some of the XR subsystems that Unity has. So things like their input system, their display subsystem, we're going to be taking advantage of those. And so you may see what some might call missing features from V2, when in fact they're actually uh, represented by Unity's XR subsystems 
and then our addition of custom visualizers on top of that which uh, brings to a point that I don't know if we got to into the in the presentation that we're working really hard to separate the visualization layer from the actual system layer to make it easier to customize. A good example is our visual profiler. If you like it, fantastic. It's in V3. It works just the way it used to do. But if you'd like something a little more simple, like a, um, a lerping, box of text that says what your frame rate is, what your refresh rate and whatnot, you can have that as well. Or if you'd like to do your own kind of heads up display for performance stats, it's all a lot more customizable and flexible. Awesome question, Sean. I see a comment from Walter Martens. The new MRTK design language seems very cool. Atomic design and volumetric layout features are definitely something we'd use on a daily basis. Thumbs up for these. Thank you for that comment. That is great to hear. All right, I see a question from Sadiq. Is there any benefits MRTK team planning to utilize .NET 6 and C Sharp 10? I'll lob this one over to Curtis and Dave to see what their thoughts on this one are. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly happy to talk about it. I mean, so right, right now, um, our sort of minimum version plan is to to be Unity 2020 focused. Um, I believe a lot of the sort of you know .NET improvements and, and C sharp upgrades and Mono upgrades started mostly landing and bulking Unity 2021. Um, so you know, there may you know be some places where it makes sense for us to. You know, if you're running on Unity 2020, we have to do it the old way. If you're running on Unity 2021, we'll use this, you know, some of these nice, uh, nice new features. We So I guess all, all of that to say we we don't have, you know, a solid list of things that it's like, um, you know, oh, you know, with with .NET, you know, 6 or .NET 5 and C Sharp, various C Sharp versions that that those those will be sort of solid improvements that we'll make. But um, it's 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 also you know, sort of something that's in the back of our mind when we we start, you know, looking at you know you, when we're using unity 2021 the, the things that pop up and and the, the, the improvements that we can make are certainly there so nothing nothing sort of solid but but certainly it's it's another another tool in our sort of tool belt that, that this, that's in the back of our mind so but yeah th thanks for thanks for bringing that up because uh, it, it is pretty awesome you know for forever tk and for anybody that just writes unity uh, i've been super happy watching all of those improvements roll into unity 2021 Awesome. Thanks, Curtis. We've got another question. This one from Walter Martins. Performance improvements when running on device is a very nice update as well. However, is there also a goal for improving performance when working with MRTK inside the Unity editor? Today, we seem to experience a performance impact when MRTK is added to our Unity projects, slightly impacting our workflow. Does the team at Microsoft experience this as well? So a couple things to to kick this question off, and then I'll I'll hand things over to uh, to Dave and Curtis as well. I think our new architecture of allowing you to bring in you know, the the parts of MRTK that you want is going to significantly address this. What we know from our qualitative uh, surveying is that not everyone uses all of the toolkit in every single project. So uh, you know when it comes to our new packaging solution. Uh, to just bring in bits and pieces, I think that'll certainly help. Uh, I know our transition to Unity Package Manager has also provided some performance improvements. Uh, most of those improvements I've heard of as being on the Visual Studio side as opposed to in Editor. So I would love to hear from Dave if there are any things, anything this individual can do to improve performance in the Editor and how V3 will address this as well. That's a good point, Kevin. Um, one of the things yeah, the packaging changes that you mentioned are actually one of the things that we're using to improve in editor performance. And we're constantly trying to limit our editor time code that must, that gets run, which will slow you down in there. Uh, we're going to get to where you'll see more packages. So Kevin mentioned we went from one to eight. We don't have a firm number, but the the 
wild guess I like to throw out is about, say, 20, where each one will be limited to just the functionality that is required. So you'll have less code to process, less things that run every time the uh, the packages or the project is reloaded, which will should all improve the performance within the editor. Great answer, Dave. Thank you. I saw someone ask, uh, is there a way to follow up with us after this presentation? Absolutely. Uh, GitHub is the best way to uh, file feature requests or bugs. And if you mention, hey, I saw your presentation uh, at the MR Speaker Series, you know, we can make sure that uh, we you know, get to any questions or, or uh, requests that you have. Also, if you have Slack, you can join the Hollow tool, or sorry, the Hollow Developer Slack channel. That is where you can find not just us, but a great community of MR developers as well. And we can make sure we get your questions answered there. All right, and please keep upvoting the questions you want to see uh, get answered. That's how we're choosing which questions get answered next. Uh, let's see the next question question here. Will there be any kind of support for some standard XR interactions like a QR package directly embedded in the feature tool? I know, uh, Dave, you've been working quite a bit on the feature tool. In fact, it's your it's your baby, so to speak. That's true. Uh, I am always in contact with the feature teams at Microsoft for getting their packages uh, like promoted in the feature tool. The QR code team is one that is on my list and I talk to them regularly. We don't have a timeline to share right now, but we are doing what we can to get it in the feature tool as soon as possible. Great. Question, uh, the next question here, let me make sure I'm sorting this correctly. All right, this question is from Wouter. In MR2K v2, UI elements are built on game objects rather than using Unity canvases. The Unity canvas already offers a lot of tools for responsive designs, automatically laying out objects relative to each other. Oh, it, question jumped. Looks like we're getting new questions in. Let me find that one again. Oh, so many new questions. It has moved in my list. Here we are. Is this still the case with V3 or will buttons, sliders, panels, and other UI be optimized to work with the already existing UI tools in Unity? If not, why was that approach taken? So this is a, actually part of a, a larger discussion for our MRTK team when it comes to supporting Unity UI or, or even what Unity recently announced uh, the new UI toolkit that is coming. Now, we believe that we don't want to stop anyone from taking the paths that exist in Unity today, right? So if you want to use Unity UI with uh, MRTK v2, we actually have a subset of our core components available in the form of Unity UI. And I think as we proceed, we will not be disabling folks from using anything that Unity provides with MRTK. That being said, our research has showed us that when it comes to getting the best experience in mixed reality, volumetric buttons are the way to go. And so that's why our focus has been on volumetric buttons, right? When it comes to getting that feeling of pressing a hologram and making it feel and look like an actual button, it's, it's awesome how we can trick the brain into thinking you know, I'm actually pressing something that's there, even though it's not. And so we find that the limitations introduced by Canvas and, and the lack of ability to actually create something as uh, as uh, rich in, in interaction as we've seen with MRTK is what has prevented us from investing uh, as much time into the Canvas route. Uh, that's why we've looked at how we can build volumetric layout tools. Now, we know that lots of folks are using Canvas today, and so part of uh, MRTK v3 is making sure we're listening to you, our, our developers, and what we've seen is that there's actually a growing amount of folks who are building apps on Canvas. So we're currently exploring the idea of how we might introduce additional support uh, to make sure that you, know, you have more support in this path that we know is, is quite common. 
All right. I see a question from Lucas. We have more than 600 open issues in GitHub for MRTK v2. What about them? Six month support seems to not be enough to fix them. I don't think our enterprise apps will be upgraded to v3 in the near future. Great question, Lucas. There are a lot of issues in MRTK repo today and we go through our those issues to triage them on a regular basis to make sure that if there are things that we can address in v3 we do and if there are things that can only be addressed in v2 we address them there as well now there are a wide array of issues and lots of feature requests and we've chosen actually not to close feature requests that uh, might inspire someone to to actually take it upon themselves to add for example you know folks were commenting about oculus quest when it first came out uh, and uh, we saw the community respond by adding support for for quest to mrtk so although we might mrtk team not get to every single issue we believe that uh, even having ones that we might not get to open allows the community to take ownership of a part of the mrtk as well uh, so you know, we we believe that hey, there's still room for improvement in how we address the issues. You know, we I will admit, uh, you know, we we uh, do see lots of opportunity to have uh, you know faster response time to make sure that you know you're you're being well taken care of when you raise an issue. Uh, but when it comes to uh, solving every issue, I'm, I'm not sure I could say that solving every issue is our goal since this is a an, a Microsoft driven open source project, and we want to enable folks to also you know, contribute to through the toolkit as well. That being said, if there is a really important issue that is blocking your your enterprise apps, we certainly want to hear from you. And so one thing you can do to help us is either commenting or even giving a thumbs up on those issues that you believe are most important, and that'll help us prioritize, right? Some of those older issues, we go back to them and we try to ask folks, hey, is, is this something that is still important to you? And sometimes we don't get an answer and it can be hard to determine, is this where we should be putting our time? So please, please, please get into the repo, comment, like, and, and let us know what are the most important ones so we can focus our, our attention on those and make sure that your apps can, can be deployed. Curtis, Dave, anything to add there? No, no you right. covered it really well, Kevin. We'll jump to the next question then. And, and thanks again, Lucas, for that great question. I see an anonymous question here. What is the plan for Unreal support and how do the de design decisions affect that effort? So the uh, the MRTK Unreal is actually led by a different PM. And so I can't speak to their plans uh, for uh, support long term, but I would suggest that you post on their github repo and ask them directly uh, hey i heard this on the mrtk unity's uh, mr speaker series would love to know how it relates to the unreal project so that uh, we can plan for the future and one thing to add on this is xri is an implementation detail of the unity mrtk and the design aspect of it uh, we are always looking at ways to make design across products easier. And so you should separate in your mind the design of your holograms from how it's actually implemented because they may differ on the implementation, but the design may become more and more similar over time. Absolutely. All right, a question from Caleb. Outside of interactions, are there any other major major poten potential hurdles in porting from MRTK v2 to v3? I'm going to pass this one to Curtis. Sure. Um, I mean, so yeah, uh, you know, you could sort of think of MRTK as right. There's you know our, our input system, then you know all all of our sort of interactions are. are UX UI built on top of that. Um, and then there's also, you know, in, in V2, we sort of have our tools package. There's, you know, there's the build window, there's the um, like authorization window and the dependency viewer. Um, we also have just sort of a, a, you know, a handful of other just kind of, you know, behaviors like, like solvers and things that aren't as directly, you know, built on top of the input system, but still kind of 
um, it's just kind of general logic for your app. Um, I, I think certainly so far in V3, most of the change has happened in kind of that input stack because of our sort of adoption of Unity's new input system, um, the XR interaction toolkit, uh, that sort of stack and how you know how how a button reacts to your you know your motion controller or your your hand ray um, has has sort of just fundamentally changed and we've taken this time to kind of rewrite some of those components to be a little bit more robust to that right in, in v2 it was it was very strongly tied to the v2 input system and we're now kind of trying to separate out the visuals and um and kind of the behavior from you know what what does it mean for you know a motion controller to to select a button and so you know help prefer you know presumably going forward uh, you know the, the work we're doing today will, will hopefully re reduce the the sort of you know churn and need for change in let's say you know or TK four or five six whatever you know whatever uh, sort of decisions as we move to maybe you know more dots or ECFs like the, the earlier question so so we're, we're trying we are trying to make decisions this sort of in this process that that will help make us more robust to change on you know specific parts of the toolkit. Um, while 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 hopefully making sort of the the porting story or the the transition story a little bit easier going forward so yeah for 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 input and ux i'd, I'd say that's where um currently i'm I, I see the most kind of need for for a sort of you know port um but for a lot of the other things like you know the build window and the tools um we're we're i i see most of their sort of v3 story being on kind of the packaging and distribution side where we we're going to start being a little bit sort of more uh, more I don't know more intelligent or, or a little bit nicer about how how you are able to consume those packages in your toolkit like you know Kevin Kevin went into sort of our, our packaging philosophy for for v3 um and I, I I wouldn't anticipate a ton of sort of you know my, migration need for for some of those components um and and you know, solvers as well. Um, the solvers are, are have have been ported over, and and I wouldn't anticipate it to have, you know a ton of need for change there. So yeah, I, I would say the core UX story is is where most of our sort of um, rework has been happening. And um, there's you know there's there's always going to be some sort of porting going forward, whether we've sort of slightly updated the namespaces or the the assembly names or however you might be referencing our our scripts, but um, Going forward, yeah, we're certainly keeping it top of mind. Not not changing things for the sake of changing them, and anywhere that we can make that porting story easy, um, easier, that's that's our plan. And one quick thing to add: as we move more and more of our what we used to call our systems or our services into Unity's implementation, so the XR subsystems you may have some code that is different. For example, you won't use the spatial awareness system anymore. You'll use what's in XR, sorry, XR foundation, sorry, XR management and AR foundation, which will be common from on HoloLens, iOS, Android, any other platform that does uh, like a spatial mapping type feature. So there will be some API changes going from our co old core systems to the new way of doing things. But as a question that I just happened to see came up, we are planning on working as much as possible on some migration tools to help you get from V2 to V3. And at the very least, we'll have documentation on what needs to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see this question from Chris. Where can we find documentation on these changes and updates? Uh, following this presentation, we will be looking to update our roadmap section of our MRTK documentation page. However, given that we are still pretty early in our development, we don't have robust documentation to share just yet. What you can expect, however, is that leading up to our public preview, we will be putting out documentation so that you can understand what you would be getting yourself into when it comes to V3. Uh, and, and so if you have any follow-up questions on specific features that you want to learn more about, feel free to, to ask your question here or, or uh, post it on our GitHub as well. Or even ask it in the Hollow Developer Slack channel. So thanks for that question, Chris. All right, let's see. Next up here, 
Question from Asia. For those who need to migrate to the newer version of Unity and also migrate projects to XR, there will be some migration tool. Do we need to rewrite the entire project? Thanks. So migration tools, uh, we've, we do have some plans to create some migration tools when we GA MRTK V3. This would be focused on moving you from V2 to V3. So I'd be interested to learn more about, uh, you know, what type of project you have if you're migrating it to XR for the first time, because th there might be some things that uh, you would need to change. For example, we see a lot of people get significant performance improvements when they use the MRTK standard shader, for example. And so, you know, lots of things to do with MR specific that you can uh, do that are part of the project creation process or can be found in documentation to make your project ready for mixed reality. Uh, anything else you can think of, Dave or Curtis? Uh, no, yeah, I think you covered it pretty well that we're looking, investigating plans for as many migration tools as we can create, as much documentation as we can write, and definitely look into the current performance guidance on the MRTK2 documentation for things like the using the standard shader and any other ways that you can make your code more as performant as possible on mobile class devices. Awesome. All right, the next question here, will you implement new tools for shaders, something like enabling clippers for any shader with one click or maybe some sort of ability to have a wireframe or transparency on proximity? Curtis, do you want to take this one? Sure. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a very uh, timely question as well. It's, it's a sort of conversation that we're having internally as well. Um, you know, I, I, we, we talked a little bit about sort of the the kind of new MR design language and, and you know, what our story for, for you know, the MRTK standard shader is going forward into V3. Um, there, are, there are some components that right now in our development have you know, their own bespoke shaders and don't use the standard shader, which, which you know, then, then does put us into a, uh, an, an interesting scenario because it's like, oh, if we want to support something like the, you know, the proximity light where, that's driven currently in MRTK2, right? It's driven by a script using um, properties on the MRTK standard shader. It's like, what what does that look like when um, when we have you know multiple shaders and not everything is just using one? And so we we have had some discussions um, around you know yeah what what would it look like if we pull out certain features like you know clipping or the proximity light um, into kind of a, a like some sort of uh, you know shader re resource file that you can just kind of include in in any uh, in you know any shader that you might be developing and and kind of get some of that um, some of that functionality a little bit more easily. So um, where all that to say, yeah, uh, certainly this is something that we're we're looking into and and trying to figure out kind of what our shader story for V three going forward is as well. Um, but it's it's still in. Very, very recent conversation, and so we're trying to figure that out. But um, certainly, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of the idea of, 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 you know, us enabling some of these features for, you know, everyone to use in their own sort of custom shaders as much as possible. But yeah. Great question, great answer. All right, I see oh, some new ones still popping in. Uh, let me scroll to the bottom here. All right, I see a question here that says, any HUDs? I'm assuming you're referring, Carlos, to any heads up displays. Uh, I can't say that there are currently any plans to add them to the Mixed Reality Toolkit, if that's what you're referring to, but based on the you know the way the toolkit is structured you could create one yourself so if you do please take a video because that sounds super cool and i would love to see it if you're referring to something other than heads up displays please uh you know uh feel free to reply to your question with uh, some clarification there awesome moving on to the next question then 
Question from Derek. I'm very interested in the in the data binding. My team uses a custom data binding solution that works like React JS and is data first using models, views, and view models. Can we get some more insight into what the data binding in MRTK looks like at a high level? Dave or Curtis, do you want to take this one? I think the answer is a qualified yes, that information will be coming. Um, we just need to draft the documentation and get it published alongside the package. I don't have any firm dates on when that would happen, but it is something that I will seed in the mind of the uh, developers and who are responsible for our data binding system. Awesome, thanks for the question, Derek. Uh, based on what you saw in today's presentation, I'd be interested to learn if there's something specific you were looking for that you didn't see that you have in your current system so that we can use that question to uh, give to our developers to drive that documentation that we're going to be putting out. Awesome. A question from Samuel Martins at Glartech. Could you elaborate on how UI UX designer would improve the MRTK V3 UI? Consider no programming. Thank you. I'm not quite sure what you mean by improve the MRTK V3 UI. Uh, you know, we did show off some volumetric layout tools that you could use to quickly lay out UI. Uh, we showed a theming option so that you can create your own custom themes and apply your branding, your look and feel, and then quickly swap between them. As with MRTK V2, you know, you're able to customize icons, uh, text, the, the look of the, the, the mesh, but all of that can now go into this, uh, this theming system so you can swap between multiple themes. Uh, as a, as a, oh, I lost the question here. Yeah, I, if you have something, uh, if I didn't answer your question clearly, I would love to hear more uh, so that I can give you a better answer on that question. All right, moving on to the next question then. I see a question from Kirk Duncan, Microsoft support for WebRTC will cease. What will replace WebRTC with MRTK and Unity? Is it WinRTC or Mesh or something else? Where is the development of that new platform up to, please? Now, I wish I had more information to share on Mesh, but unfortunately I can't speak to Mesh at this time. So. I really have a, a good non-answer for you. I, I don't have a good answer for you. And uh, I hate to say it, but uh, uh, that's all I can say at this time. Will you switch to, would you, will you switch from Slack to Teams for the communication and will future meetings be in mesh for Teams? <laughs> Thanks for the question, uh, Khaled from Island Labs. Uh, currently, Slack is working really well. I'm not aware of any plans to switch from Slack to Teams for communication. Uh, and uh, I know that uh, our, our community is still continuing to grow. So uh, will that change in the future? I don't know. When it comes to hosting meetings in Mesh, you know, we do have the Microsoft Mesh app. If you would like to meet up in Mesh, you know, we can definitely get some uh, spin something up in the Hull Developer Slack channel to have a meetup in Mesh, in the in the Mesh app. If if you'd like, that sounds like it'd be fun. You customize your avatars, and we can have some chats. All right, question from Sadiq. Unity and Unreal engines are two choices right now for the HoloLens 1 and 2 development. Microsoft has powerful VS IDE and VS Code IDE. Although both are used primarily for core development and not really for any game development for sure, the way Dedicate Game Engine offers. However, non-game solution, Microsoft has any plan to have its own IDE without any dependencies of any game engine? Well, I think uh, that is a great question because we we have a, a, a solution called Stereo Kit, which uh, isn't quite an IDE, but is a non-game engine way 
to develop for mixed reality. Uh, so I'm not sure if that answers your question directly, but uh, it is something. It is another open source project that doesn't use Unity or Unreal, and is a, a great option to explore. And uh, if you're looking to contribute to that project as well, I encourage you to check it out. Uh, and it looks like uh, looks like Nick, who introduced the presentation, is going to uh, may even drop a link to the repo so you can go check it out. All right, question from Gene. Can you reiterate your timeline for preview and initial release? Yes, yeah, so our public preview is targeting spring of 2022. Now, we haven't solidified our firm date for our official release as we want to make sure that we're incorporating the major feedback we get from you, the community, uh, into whatever goes out in our, our official GA release. So, you can expect it to be sometime after spring of 2022, and we'll follow up with a more firm date uh, in the uh, in the coming months. All right, still getting new questions. This is great. An anonymous question, by any chance, do you have some publicly available papers on UX experiences like the preference of volumetric buttons that you mentioned? Yes, the uh, let me see if I can find the link here. There is there, there's there been a lot of research done into volumetric UX and it is posted on the docs.microsoft.com web page. So I'm going to quickly search for a link here. Also, you can check out the Designing Holograms app in the in the App Store. So if you have a HoloLens today, you can go to the App Store. You can download this app that actually teaches you how to build for mixed reality through a mixed reality app, which is super cool. It was designed uh, from it was designed by some developers here at uh, at Microsoft, and I think it is an awesome way to not just experience MR but also teach how to design for MR as well. So just a moment, I'm going to hand over a question to one of the other guys so I can go look for this link for you because it's a bit tricky to speak and search at the same time. All right, a follow up question from Samuel Martins. Ah, my question relates to changing the backplate look for multiple pieces groups of UI components. Context, we have several UI components like a hand menu with many buttons and a floating menu with other groups of buttons. Considering that a visual UI revamp would be necessary for the backplate overall style. Would a designer need to create a backplate image with specific sizes for all buttons or just create a single image shader that all buttons use and scale depending on each component size? I'll pass this one off to Curtis while I go look for that link. Sure, sounds good. Um, yeah, uh, uh, I, I think, you know, Generally, a, a lot of what you're you're sort of asking about here relates to some of the data binding and theming work um, that that we've been sort of making making a priority in V3. Um, so you sort of sort of yeah. Right now we've got you know it it partially is based on kind of the the site like a style sheet concept where you can kind of did, uh, specify a font and and colors and that sort of thing. Um, certainly, you know, uh, support for changing the material or changing the shader. Um, I don't, I don't recall exactly if that's there yet, but I, I know that's certainly something we've been talking about. Um, yeah, the, the, the idea there is just, yeah, that, that as many of the pieces of, you know, a button or a UX component, uh, whether it's, you know, the, the back plate or whatever that you would be wanting to, um, to customize, uh, we want to make that available for customization in in the theming system. So, uh, yeah, I I would say yeah, it sounds like uh, you know a lot of, of what you're asking about. You know, several UI components with, with buttons, um, other groups of buttons that you kind of just want to you know design once. You know, click a button and it it just kind of blasts it out there to to all of your buttons. Um, yeah, ho hooking all of that up into our into the sort of data binding theming system um, sounds like it it can accomplish. Um, everything just about everything that you're you're mentioning here um yeah yeah creating the backplate image of specific sizes um yeah I, I think that's that's something that can be handled kind of by the, the material sort of changing part of of the data binding and theming um 
but yeah, I, I would say, yeah, that's that's going forward. That's definitely going to be the, the path you want to look into for supporting something like this. Um, and certainly if you, you know, when, when we start talking more about it or when it goes out of preview and you, you, you find some something that you want to change or that you feel like you should be able to change that, that it doesn't support. Um, it becomes a great, a great, you know, feature request, a great conversation starter for us to improve on that, um, improve on that feature. So, yeah. Thanks for the great question, Samuel. All right, the next question is from Raphael Derbier. Sorry if I mispronounce your name. Uh, when Googling to find a solution about HoloLens, you have a very high chance of getting an outdated info with all the versions we have. Any idea to address this issue? Yes, so one of the ways we have been addressing this is through consolidating our docs from GitHub to docs.microsoft.com. One of the issues with having lots of versions of docs on GitHub is that each version doc is actually competing with SEO uh, with the other versions of that exact same page. And if there was a page from an older version that was more visited, you know, maybe that release was, uh, you know, pretty uh, pretty old and had lots of people asking questions about it, the SEO would, you know, sometimes bump it up on your Google search results. With our new solution on docs and Microsoft.com. We don't have that competition between pages that have similar information for different versions, and so we have seen some improvement. Uh, however, we are constantly reviewing our docs to make sure that uh, that we are we have the most up to date information there. Now, the best way to to address this is, uh, you know, by by numbers. If you end up on a page that you find to be outdated, you can actually click at the bottom uh, and leave feedback. Each docs page on docs.microsoft.com is tied to a GitHub repo that we monitor with our uh, our docs team. So if you find something that doesn't quite look right, just drop us a message. Hey, this looks out of date and that can help our, our docs team uh, stay on top of things. So thanks for the question. The next question is from Sylvain. Does the current interaction scheme, hand raise, grab to move, rotate, et cetera, have a lot of UX design consideration behind it? And how do you go about it? Or is it more of an inspiration for what could be possible with the HoloLens? Great question. So the way the MR org is structured, we actually have a whole team that is dedicated to just interactions. They're constantly looking at what are the ways that people currently interact with things? What are new ways that they'll want to interact with things? And they do a lot of that exploration. And then the MRTK team, we have a lot of exposure to you, our end users and uh, enterprise customers. And so we actually join forces with that team and iterate on new solutions for interactions. And then they decide what they're gonna build into the platform, like you know the HoloLens 2 shell. And once they've made that decision, we take that design and we bring it to MRTK. So that's a bit of insight into the process. And you know, during those steps, there's a lot of user research going on to validate these interactions with, with humans as well. So I hope that answers your question. It's, it's not just us thinking aspirationally, it's a collaborative effort with uh, teams across mixed reality. All right, next question. Will there be a focus at some point to provide more examples of integrating HoloLens 2 in Unity with the Azure stack, especially around IoT Hub and digital twins? Thanks for the question, Preston. Now, we do have lots of tutorials around the Azure stack today, and I know that there was a tutorial uh, slash sample app released around digital twins a few months ago, one that had a, a windmill example. So I'd be curious if you had a chance to, to look at that. When it comes to integrating these with MRTK, however, that is something that is on our radar, You know, making it super easy for people to bring Azure services into MRTK. And although we do have tutorials that teach you how to do this, making it even easier is something that, uh, that we would like to do. So thank you for this feedback. I'll be noting down that IoT Hub and Digital Twins are of interest. Awesome. All right, the next question. This 
this is a, an anonymous question. To use a sprite as icon for a presso button, Hollands 2, or any other button, do we still need to create an icon set, or the sprite can be assigned directly from the inspector panel? Hmm. I would need to go revisit the icons specifically to be able to answer that question. So I can't give you a direct answer now, but uh, if you post the same question in our GitHub repo, we can make sure we get an answer to you. Another anonymous question, do you have any plans to add 3D charts for dynamic real-time data and work reports? Ooh, that is an interesting question. I would love to hear more about the scenario you're trying to, to solve there. There currently aren't any plans to add this, but you know, if we hear a compelling scenario, that that could change. You know, we, we want to respond to your needs. So please share the scenario as a feature request uh, on our GitHub repo so that we can get an opportunity to ask you questions and figure out what the best approach for this might be. All right. A yeah, question from Sergio. If I want to try my first Holland's 2 project in Unity, should I start with the sample Unity MRTK v2 project and in spring 22 upgrade to v3? Dave, what do you think is the best approach for Sergio here? That's an interesting one because if you familiarize yourself with the volumetric controls that we have in MRTK v2, you'll be familiar with them in v3, but you'll have breaking changes to uh, your input implementation like Curtis was describing earlier. If you start with XRI, you're going to be in a better position to have fewer breaking changes, but you won't have our control set yet. So I'm maybe a little of both. <laughs> Definitely, though, get started in Unity 2020.3 on OpenXR. That, regardless of what you choose, that is probably the best advice I can give. Thanks, Dave. And it looks like we have uh, time for one more question as, uh, as we wrap up here. So for this last question, I see one from uh, Raphael uh, Derbier. Layout improvements look good and useful. Curious to see which features can also help the layout of holograms added and positioned by the user in the scene. We have surface magnetism, but I think we need more alignment constraints, such as auto spacing position in the same horizontal plane. Now, if I understand this question correctly, you're asking for alignment in addition to surface magnetism so they can be used together, it sounds like. Uh, the volumetric layout tools that we demoed today should be able to support this. Uh, we saw uh, the, uh, the layout that allows you to stack objects along a particular axis. So if you were to stack them along an axis and then apply surface magnetism, I believe this should work. However, I do need to go experiment and, and prove it out. But what you're describing, you know, alignment is one of the specific scenarios that we're trying to solve because I personally believe alignment is one of those things that makes an app, whether it's 2D or 3D, look polished. Alignment and good spacing. All right, thank you so much for everyone that asked questions. If you did not get your question answered, please ask it again on our GitHub repo so that we can uh, answer it for you. And with that, I will just hand things off to Nick. Awesome, thank you so much. That was a fantastic presentation and uh, thank you everybody for all the questions. It was uh, really great to hear all that discussion. And I, I really hope that uh, you got your question answered and if you didn't, please uh, make sure that you contact them on their uh, GitHub issues page. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for answering all your questions. Thanks for, for uh, taking the time and uh, thank you everybody for coming. Um, we do have an event on the, uh, let's see, I believe this is the 18th. And this one actually does go a little bit further into uh, some of the OpenXR and XRI content. Uh, and this one's actually uh, hosted by uh, Unity uh, as well. So this is the Unity side of the equation. So definitely uh, check on the Meetup page uh, for that event, November 18th.
Um, then I've also got a few more links. Uh, they mentioned the survey, and you may have seen that in the um, uh, Q&A tab, uh, but this is a super, super short little uh, survey. It's like two questions long. So if, if you haven't uh, done that yet, uh, we'd really appreciate it if you did it. Uh, it'll only take a few moments, and the, I know the MRTK would really appreciate the feedback. Um, and then uh, beyond that, we've got our, our regular links. Um, there's more events on the Meetup page, aka.ms slash mrmeetup, the newsletter, I want MR, um, and the tech community forums. Also for the, the month of November, we are hosting a Stereo Kit Hackathon. I know this was mentioned briefly in the presentation. Uh, so if that was of interest to you, uh, you may want to check that out and see if that's uh, something you want to do with uh, some of your November time. But anyhow, thank you everybody for coming and we'll see you around for our next Mixed Reality Speaker Series. Take care.